Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence, and a big mahalo for tuning in as we welcome another music legend. Today we follow up our recent conversation with The Temptations' Otis Williams by welcoming another original soul-surviving member of an iconic American vocal group. This quartet started in Detroit in high school in the 50s. They performed together without a lineup change until 1997. My guest today has been part of their history from the very beginning. His band are coming to Hawaii with The Temptations, a tour pattern they've sometimes shared since 1983 as a road pairing pretty often. We're excited to welcome them for dates August 12th in Honolulu, August 14th on the Big Island, and August 15th on Maui. All three shows are on sale now, and it's a great honor to welcome from the Four Tops, Duke Fakir. Aloha, Duke. Aloha. Uh, Dave, how are you? I am good, man. Thank you so much for taking some time for me. What a privilege. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. It, it feels good to be able to talk to our friends over there uh, since we haven't been there in quite a while. So I, I'm pretty excited, and all of us are pretty excited. In fact, most guys are bringing their wives. Uh, and just kind of, you know, this, this is a place you're supposed to enjoy in many ways, not just the performance, but you should enjoy the beauty of the islands and all that's around it. So we're looking forward to it. Plus, it's been a while. You know, we hate to not go to places. If, uh, you know, and, and it takes so long to get back because I think it's been almost t- about ten years since we've been since we performed there. And when we performed there, that was a private engagement uh, on a New Year's uh, New Year's Eve going into 2000. I remember that because uh, it was like 1999, uh, December 31st, and we was looking to see if anything strange was going to happen and this and that. <laughs> Thing went smooth, and we had a wonderful engagement, and we stayed a few days and had a wonderful time. <clears throat> the people there are always so friendly, so warm, so wonderful. Uh, it's just a shame we just don't get there, you know, like at least every other year or every two or three years. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could have you on that sort of basis. And while you're in that memory mode, Duke, can you sort of just try to take me back, if you can, and think informally with me, if you could try to recall some of your earliest, if not your first visit to Hawaii? Uh, The first visit to Hawaii, you know, we've been there about five or six times. Uh, They they all are so exciting. I'm, I'm getting them mixed up about the first one well I, I remember the first one it was just great you know, yeah i remember the greeting the first one we first get off the plane and they greet you and they, and they put the flowers around your neck that to me was was one wonderful and, and just and then i just started looking around and, and the beauty around and the people smiling and and you know it's just such a beautiful place and i, I think i had my i had my wife uh, with me then and i think i had a, a, ch- a child with me and i was so busy enjoying the island, I even forgot, I practically forgot what the engagement was like, but I remember <laughs> my family and I, we were really beaching. I was quite young then. I, I think that was in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, could have been like 30 years ago, 30-something years ago. Uh, so I, I was really enjoying the beauty of the island, you know, swimming and just hanging around and lovely, wonderful drinks wife going shopping and, and looking around. The, the, the beauty of it all, and I call it the indoor, outdoor living of the, of the islands, it so intrigued me. That still is my wife's favorite, favorite place. Have you come here a lot just for personal time on vacation and stuff, or only professionally? Yes, my wife and I have, have come uh, probably three, maybe three, four times, um, for sometimes just a weekend and sometimes a week or so. Uh, yes, we have. We, we've come to two, a couple of different islands, mostly mostly Maui and, and of course, the Big Island. Um, a lot of people like to go to the other islands. I haven't been to, uh, I think we went to one other island, but it, that was just one engagement. We like Maui a lot, and we like the, the, the Big Island. Um, so, uh, so we, yeah, we come there and kind of hang out, my wife and I. When, when was the last time you were on the Big Island? From this time. <laughs> When was the last time you were on the Big Island? Um, the last time I was on the Big Island was uh, 1999, going into 2000. Okay, so for that gig that you did that you're talking about. Right, right. Oh, wait a minute. What? Her and I came, I'm sorry. Her and I came about two years later for a special vacation that we did. Yep. <laughs> okay, so you like that Big Island. That, yeah. Mm. What is it about the Big Island that calls out to you so much, Duke? Well, you know, because it, it, it has the activity uh, that we, you know, 
Uh, being a city person, you, we like cities, city kind of things, activities. Uh, so you see more people doing more things. You know, some people like quiet when they go to, to islands. We like activity a, a lot. Sometimes we like quiet, but most times we like activities and see people doing things, getting boat rides and, uh, you know, sharing things with people, wonderful restaurants. She likes shopping. Um, and she, you know, she just loves being on the big island. There's something about it. Are, are you thinking, are you saying the island that has Honolulu, or are you talking about the island with Kona and Hilo? I'm talking about Honolulu. Okay, that's Oahu. That's the name of this island, Oahu. Big island. Say again? I'll call it the big island. <laughs> the big island or not, that's what I call the big island. <laughs> the big island is the one that uh, you're playing second on this coming tour. That's the one that has Kona and Hilo. Oh, okay. The volcano. Oh, okay. So I, I, I'm getting. Uh, okay, I've, I've renamed it for my sake. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, no, but you're, what you're saying though makes a lot of sense, and it's a kind of it's an insight into you. You're saying that you, when you come here, you kind of like the mix of having the natural environment mixed with a city as a base. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of what drew me here too. So we share that for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. Uh, so we and we're always anxious to see how the people respond because we don't get there much. In most places we always pretty much know what the response is going to be. We know the response will be pretty good, but you still kind of anticipate it because you haven't been there in quite a while. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, we're really, really looking forward to this particular uh, in, engagement simply because it's been such a you know quite a quite a long time. Yeah, well, I mean, it has a, uh, it kind of brings up to me uh, an era in your life. It started, it was back in the early 1980s when in 1983 at Motown 25, there was uh, almost sort of like a recreation of those Battle of the Band gigs that you did in the 60s with the Temptations. And, and is it true? That's sort of when you guys started touring together pretty often. Oh, exactly. In fact, while we were rehearsing that week, uh, our manager at that time, Ron Strauss, and myself started looking. I said, man, you know what? And I, I mentioned him. I said, this is really going to be hot. I said, yeah. And so we started talking. I said, you know, I think the people would really like to see this, uh, you know, out, out um, on tour. And so right then we started thinking in terms of how can we put this together. So we we started talking to Otis. And we and at that time we also talked to Smokey. We say, why don't we mm. then, and then if we had Smokey, we could really do some great big venues. Huge. So at first, Smokey Robinson agreed to, and at the last minute, he decided, well, he'd rather not. He'd rather stay out on his own. Uh, he said, y'all would still be great just doing it to two for you by yourself. So, well, we went to work on putting a show together <clears throat> for the first, like, maybe 10 years. We started out coming on stage together and doing things together. Uh, and bringing each other on, and we would uh, uh, we would take turns closing, which we do now. Uh, so we had uh, quite a few things that we did together, and, and it was really fun. It was exciting. People loved it, and and even now to this day, after all those years, people still are trying to figure out which group they like the best. <laughs> so, uh, it's still a, a battle. It's competition to them, uh, and and for us, what it does, it, it keeps us really at at our at a good performing level. Because uh, you can't go to sleep any night while you're at the temps. And I'm sure they won't go to sleep. <laughs> Just go through the motions while they're working with the tops. Because uh, uh, you get blown off the stage. And, and, our, and then the penalty is you get laughed and talked about. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's worse than paying money sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, we're just, you know, if, if, some, if the attempts to go to sleep. I mean, and we don't really compete, but the audience kind of makes us feel like that. So we, we, we razz each other if if they kind of fall down, if anybody falls down on the job. So there's no falling down on the job. The people really are the winners. They're gonna, they really get uh, two well-put-together shows at a great pace uh, with a great enthusiasm and passion. Because, first of all, we love our fans. We both are there for our fans. We, we're there to give them what they want. Uh, but it keeps us at a, at a level, we call it at the uh, tournament level, <laughs> you know what I mean, playoff level. <laughs> well, that's that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I mean, so uh, we have a lot of fun with it, but we're serious when we're on stage, but it's still fun. And after the show, you know, we, we'll hang out together or we'll go eat together or, or what, or whatever. And, um, and, and it's great to have 
that kind of camaraderie uh, with, with with guys that you've known for for quite a while. Well, Otis, it's funny because in my interview, I spoke to Otis just recently, and he credited you guys, and he said that it's really when you guys tour together, it pushes the temptations to new heights when they're live and they have to be on the same bill with the four tops. So it's really nice to see it's reciprocal. Uh, yeah, and we, but we know we both uh, look forward to that. We both we both know that we both are driven. Uh, you know, people might they might be getting the best of the tops and temps when we are together. Maybe I, I kind of have to have that feeling because you, you, you know, you just can't. You know, some nights you, wow, man, you know, we got to close. We got to, wow, we got to close and attempts and burn the stage up. What, what can we do tonight? <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> some nights, you know, uh, but even though you always like to close, because you know, in people's mind, if you close, and, and we alternate every night, in, in people's mind, when you close, they they always feel like you're the star of that right. period, regardless. Regardless, they don't know about you alternating and all that. Well, when you they see you, whoever closed, they think they're the star. But some nights, the opening act, they say, "Wow, uh, what is, I don't know what the temps gonna do tonight. Did you top that, or or vice versa?" They, some people say, "I don't know how the tops gonna top this if the temps and open it up with a bang. That's like closing the show down." Uh, but you know, everybody holds their own, and and, and it becomes great fun. And what, what I like about it is the people are always extremely happy. And I think that's why we're fortunate enough for the show to still keep going on. We still keep getting calls. Um, for the both of us, that has to be at least 60% of the engagements that we do throughout the year. Uh, and and it doesn't seem to, to, to stop. And it's all right with me because I'm having great fun still. <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's really a, a testament to the two of you guys that you're able to both be out there together and that you both look at playing on the same tour as not just a, a friendship and a friendly rivalry, but a way to sort of, I mean, you both have said it, your game is at its best when you have the other element there sort of pushing you on. And also, I guess another part of it, Duke, which we didn't mention is, and you mentioned it briefly, but um, Otis and I were talking about it too, that rotating the sets probably helps too, huh? Because then one of you is, is on the, on the uh, front end and then the next night it's the opposite. Exactly right. All right. So, uh, you know, so it, it, every night it, it's, it's a little different, uh, but you have to be on your toes. Uh, but we're very fortunate, and we know we are, uh, we, <clears throat> because it, it, see, people, I think people really feel like they, they're really getting double the value for their money. Oh, they, they totally are. Can you take me back to that whole... I'm fascinated by these whole Battle of the Bands that Barry Gordy would do. Can you, I mean, take me back to the 60s and maybe him first that laying it on you as an idea. Like, how did it all start? Well, first of all, it was Barry's idea to, to put this together uh, in, uh, for, the, for the coming together of the 25th. But even before then, uh, when we had the Motown reviews, when we were traveling around, uh, it was just automatic competition. Uh, even in the studios, everything was competition. But everything was competition in a very loving, friendly, warm way. I mean, everybody competed. I mean, even, I, I'll put it like this. I'll use this example. Holland Dozier and Holland, first of all, would compete with Norman Whitfield. Norman Whitfield was the producer uh, for The Temptations. They would, they would be competing with each other, and they would bet on, I bet you we would get a number one tune mm. before you get one for The Temps, all right? Okay. Then it would come down to the engineers, whoever was engineering Holland Dozier, Holland stuff with the Four Tops, or Norman Whitfield stuff with the Temps. They would bet that I bet you my mix is going to be better than yours, and go. It went right on down town to the artist, and so forth and so on. We would bet. Uh, hey, look, I bet you we'll get to number one before you do, or, or we might even bet. Well, this our record is going to be a top five, and I bet yours not, and stuff like that. Uh, but and it was fun. And we would bet. I mean, sometimes it's pretty good old bets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was all kind of competition, you know, but it was great. It was warm. It was wonderful. And it, and it filtered down all the way down, uh, sometimes even to the writers. Um, Doge and Holland, you know, not only would, would they compete with Norman about uh, producing, they would, they would compete with them about writing. So I think I can write a number one before you write another number one for The Temptation. Boom. Bet's on. Uh, so it was. We had a lot of fun, uh, you know, at Motown doing the, doing things that way. And and at the end, we all, uh, you know, we all shared in 
and and the goodness of it and it was it was never a hard feeling bet or there was never a loser you know what i mean it was still a win win right. no matter what because it, the bar was constantly being raised songwriters were starting to write better and better and better singers were singing better uh even down to choreography you know you you you, you say wow man the tents are really really dancing and we say well you know we don't dance quite as good as the tents but we have to find something to do in our movement that's just as uh, exciting to the audience. So, you know, on every level, you had to think of your, of, of your competing person, whether it's to, you know, wait a minute, I've got to jump to something else. The hardest thing to do, to be on a show with Gladys Knight, the miracle, the temptation, and the four tops. Now, you want to, you talk about some competition. <laughs> you talking about sweating before you go on stage. Right. <laughs> and, and that's when everybody had, like, hit records out in, on the radio at the same time. Uh, you know, it's, you know the audience is going to like what you do, but still, you worry uh, you're going to get walked over by the you know, Gladys Knight Phipps, from the, one of the greatest groups ever. Temptations, one of the best five men group ever. Uh, the Miracles with Smokey Robinson is there, smoothest, sweetest. I mean, you, woo. and and the, and the four <laughs> tops. I mean, this was uh, you know, it was a wonderful nightmare. It's a lot of talent <laughs> and, and a lot of fun. So. Uh, so that's, you know, so that's how we really grew up in Motown, competing and loving. And then uh, when we weren't recording, we'd be playing basketball together, or we'd sit and play cards together, or we'd be on the golf course together. I mean, from Barry Gordy right down. Uh, so uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful family atmosphere. Uh, we were really busy enjoying making beautiful music, not knowing all the time what the impact was or what the impact would totally be throughout our lives, and, and to know that the fun that we were having and the music that was being created at the time is still lasting is, to me, one of the most awesome blessings, and, and just, a, a, they're not a, it's not a great mystery, because the songs, the songs were, were songs. They were songs that would really take people different places. I mean, either it made you pat your feet, or it made you want to, you love somebody, or make you want to kiss somebody, make you want to talk to somebody. It made you do something. You know, you couldn't just just sit there and say, "Oh, that's nice." <laughs> you yeah. you're going to do something. You're going to get up and do something, or go or sit there and hug your woman and tell her how much you love her uh, to the words of a beautiful love song, or you would just take her and dance with her, walk around the room. Uh, I know because I've done it myself to listening to Marvin Gaye, uh, <laughs> listening to her, her, her and Tammy, or listening to the Supremes. You know, uh, uh, no, I mean you were you were right there at the heart of, of you know, and I was swept by it. So I, I know how people who were buying the records had to feel. So it, you know, it, it, when you when we look back at that, you know, it, we, you really 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 feel great. And probably when I now that I think about it, you have to excuse me. I, I, this is my favorite subject. <laughs> uh, now when I think about it, the, the greatest thing that I feel proud of is that at the time that Motown was selling music to the world, to the people, it was like we were opening doors for each other with Martin Luther King. Uh, the great orchestrator upstairs really orchestrated things well. It's like we were seeping music into people's households where he would quietly uh talking to people and then showing people uh, we are human, we are this, we are that. And, and we were trying to show them the same thing in music and on television. And people were looking at us different. We were going places where we hadn't been before. And, and we were opening doors. And, and not, I mean, we didn't think of it so much then like that. But when I look back at it now, that's probably one of the most proudest things that I am, that musically we were a part of opening the door and spreading the love and, and showing people, yes, we are just, you know, just like you. We're just, we're just here enjoying life, you know, trying to raise our families. And, but we can sing, too. <laughs> no, you, you touched on something, actually, I, I'd like to hear a little more about. When, in that era, that formative era that you were, uh, you were there really as a part of and as a soundtrack to the civil rights movement. And in, in your mind, when you look at where the world is today versus where things were back then, how do you see... Uh, the change? Do you see it as an evolution that still has a really long way to go? Do you see it as an evolution that is really in its infancy? Where where, where are things today? 
Okay, the, the way I look at it, I mean, we have come a long way. Uh, we have come a long way. There's been, I've seen some great changes, uh, and, and there is no doubt in, in this world, in this country, you, you, if you put your mind to it and you work hard enough, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, of course, there are still discrepancies. There are still separations here and there. And, and to me, I, I think that we all have to understand, and this has to do with the culture of different people. The culture of different people will keep us a little separate. I won't say segregated, but separate uh, and closer to our own cultures that we were raised with. And, but we are understanding, people are to understand everybody else's culture a little better. And, and so everything is done pretty much with open arms. Uh, to me now, things that are pushed down and pushed back has to do more with economy. You know, no, it's just like uh, a lot of money people may not like poor people. It has nothing to do sometimes with color. You understand? Totally. It's a class distinction based on how much dough you have. More class distinction now than just color. Right. Uh, that's what I, some of the things I see. And then that's not just dominant, but it's there. You know, it's definitely there. Um, so, but we've come such a long way. I mean, when I look at it, I mean, I, I've seen some great changes. Uh, I mean, just, uh, we as a people can pretty much do what we want to do. I mean, there's, there's black people making tons of money, uh, making great headways, and in, in, um, we've got a president, okay, in, in government, in, in, in business, and in every kind of way, sports and everything, music. I mean, we're, you know, we, the door is open. All you've got to do is, is try hard, work hard, uh, and, and work the right way, and you can get there. If you don't believe it, ask Smokey, ask Michael Jordan, ask Oprah, ask, you know, and, and ask Bill Gates, just ask people, you know, who made it. It just takes hard work. Anyone. Hard work and, and, and do it from your heart. And you, and you can win in this, in this world, and especially in this country, the greatest country in the world. And, and if you travel outside this country, uh, you, you know, you, you can see it. You can see there's, there's some countries you can't even dream. So let's no one make a dream come true. You know, you know, there's not even space to dream, not time to dream or uh, about anything other than where's my next meal? How do I get to it? So uh, we, we've seen so many great changes, and I'm just proud that I grew up at the time we did and that we were musically or any kind of way a part of the culture being elevated and doors being open. And uh, and, I, and I'll put it like this. If there's a happier guy in the world than me, I don't, I don't believe he exists. <laughs> and really, it has nothing to do with money. Somebody... Somebody put it to me like this, says, you know, the Rolling Stones, they make a million dollars a night. How much y'all make? I said, no, oh, hold it, hold it. I said, all that is relative. Success is relative. Happiness is relative. I said, you know, and I love the guys, but I bet you're not one of them who's happy as I am. You know, I have a wife, I have my grandkids, I have my kids. I've done everything in life I want to do, and I'm still doing it, and I'm doing it with gusto. Uh, you know, I, could, I wake up smiling every morning. Can't wait to wake up to face the next day. Uh, you know, so it, it's all relative. It has nothing to do with how much money you have. Is how much joy have you brought to other people's lives, and how much joy have they have you gotten out of what you're doing for or to your other people and yourself? And, and it's mostly the joy comes from making other people happy because we, we're all servants. And I'm not a preacher. And my son is a pastor, but uh, but we are all servants to, and we're here to help each other, to help, help each other grow, to help each other do things. You know, that's what that's what we're here for. That's what I mean, people have dreams of getting into business to help people do this, to help people buy homes, to help people do this, uh, and, and we shouldn't do it with greed. That's one thing that that has, that has pretty much taken over this whole world. And if we can get that greed out of there, then again we'll be a, a very wholesome. A fast-growing, competitive, loving world. Uh, but we're here to help each other, and I feel really good that uh, I think we've been doing it without trying. Uh, it's just a gift that God has given some people to, you know, the musically we bring joy to other people. But they forget it's such a two-way street. They have no idea how much joy they give us. You know, when I go out on stage at night and I look in people's eyes every night, all I see is love, respect joy, happiness, these are things that you can't 
put your, put your fingers on it. A lot of people never see, and I see that every night. So you can tell, you could imagine what's inside of me because of what I see every night. I don't I have no idea what everybody does or what these people do. I just know what I see at night when I see them looking up, and I look in people's eyes, and you can see that. So when you go through life and you see that almost every night, that has to affect you as a person. So, yeah, uh, yes, I'm one of the happiest guys in the world. So do, do you think that when there are dark moments or tougher moments in your life that the reason that you're able to maintain the happy, positive demeanor you've got is possibly through the energy you're getting out of the gigs? Uh, yeah, Jan, just out of life, yeah. I mean, and, and, and no matter who you are, you will have dark moments, and I've had some. Uh, but, <clears throat> but, there's, but, but there's things like that that can carry you through it and make you forget. And then you look around, because we're able to travel a lot, you look around and you see, if you think you've got dark moments, you can look right over your shoulder and see a darker, much darker moment for right. somebody else. Right. And, and it, it lifts you right up out of that darkness. Yeah. You say, wow, this is nothing I'm going through. Right. No, well, that's always, you know, I think that's the greatest lesson for any of us. I mean, certainly most of us don't have what you have in your life, but, and that's why it's hard to think about, you know, what would the rest of us do in a dark moment? Because Duke has like this special sort of energy that his, his success has sort of made you, I mean, it, it, like you just pointed out, it's kind of insulation when those darker moments come, you have a lot to look, to look on to make you happy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and I know I'm fortunate. You're absolutely right. But everyone can look still. Most of us can look at that dark moment <clears throat> and look around us, and you will still see some darker moments from someone else. Absolutely. And that should kind of just take some of the darkness away. I mean, there, there are some people that are, that, are, that are like what I call the ten-card hole. It's almost impossible for them to, to think clearly even, I mean, because of the oppression and so many things that are happening to them. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, and 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 as a t- I've been there. I've been there. And I know. I know that point. I've been there. Come from, uh, come from a very very poor family. Uh, but to be able to rise from that and know that eventually you will rise. I've always had hope. Way as a kid, I've always had hope that there was something wonderful and better than just uh, you know just going from day to day. Uh, but there was always love around me, so that always was helpful. Duke, when you were in the '60s, um, did you uh, had have you ever met uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in person? Uh, yes, I met him and shook his hand once. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, it was just an awesome moment to me because uh, I, I looked at him in such awe at the, at the times that he were <clears throat> that he was going through his civil rights motions and, and the way he spoke and with the reverence that he spoke and the things that he had in his voice were always so touching to me. So when I, when I touched him and shook his hand, I mean, I felt like I was touching like a prophet or something, you know. Uh, you know, I, someone extremely special. And I, I hold that moment still true. Uh, I mean, that's one of the biggest moments in, in my life. Where was it? When did it happen? This was in, I think it was in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and you don't remember the year? Uh, I don't remember the exact year. It was... It was Oh, it was in the early, it was like in the mid-60s, mid-60s, like 65, 66. We had just started having hit records, and we were in Atlanta, and um, it was through some, I was going to somewhere, and I, had, and I went to this, uh, someone wanted me to go to this church where he was, where he happened to be that day. He didn't preach, but he was there that day, and... Um, and somebody in, introduced him. I think it was Reverend Jesse Jackson, who we was doing a lot of stuff for his Rainbow Coalition, mm-hmm. introduced us to him. That's what it was. Wow. Um, and I, I'll never forget that. As I uh, sort of, because uh, I, I, I keep you all day. You're so much fun to talk to, but I know you got you got to do stuff. But as you sort of uh, reflect with me on, on Dr. King, um, and it was really brilliant, by the way, to listen to some of your the eloquent way you put it, the the journey from then to now, and and how much, how many good things have come um, forward um, as a result of his efforts and other people's efforts. Um, when you think of things that have inspired you, Duke, and people who have inspired you, aside from the great Dr. King, who's an inspiration to myself as well, 
Can you just think of, as a closing thought, any other person who has inspired you, an encounter you've had with somebody, maybe a story someone shared for you, anything that basically the, the end goal here is any kind of good advice or an inspirational moment that you can leave us with? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, and, and I've had so many, I'm, I've been very blessed. I've had some really wonderful inspirational moments. But I'll, I'll tell you a good show business moment that, well, that was given to me or to us. Uh, back in uh, between 59 and 60, between 60 and 62, we were backup vocals for Billy Eckstein. Billy Eckstein, of course, you know, was, was a great male singer coming up at the same time Frank Sinatra was. He was like the black Frank Sinatra. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, he was about to marry <clears throat> this uh, particular movie star, which who was white, and they, they kind of beat his career down. But still, over the, over the years, he still was a great entertainer and a wonderful person. So we were backup vocals for him for two years because he had recorded this album with a group called the High Lows, and we could sing four-part harmony like the High Lows or the Freshmen, and he heard about these black group that could do that. And we auditioned, and we passed the audition, so he hired us. Uh, we had some wonderful time. We, we went to all the supper clubs with him. So we were in Lake Tahoe one night just before we went on stage, and he was always giving us pointers. So this time he called me today to the stage. He said, look out the curtain. He said, Duke, what do you see? I said, well, you know, B, I have to be honest with you. You know, the house is full. Uh, it it kind of looked loud. It, you know, people, all, they always kind of look the same. They're the same kind of people. You know, real cool, wonderful uh, audience just waiting for you to come on. I see, so he says, you know what I see, Duke? He said, I see people out there that bought my records in 1944. These same people have taken care of me all of my life. He says, if you're fortunate enough to get or maybe a million fans by selling records or whatever, he said, do me a favor. Take care of them. You take care of them people, give them what they want, and they will take care of you for the rest of your life in a loving way. I said, wow. And and it has happened, and that was very, I, I, I remember that, and I've always been, or we have always been the ones, we come to please the people. What do they want? That's what we want to give them. Because, uh, and they have. I mean, they have given us everything. They are the stars. They have given us everything in life that we've ever wanted. So we are just hardworking guys from Detroit with shiny jackets. The stars are the ones that pay the ticket. What an inspiring story. That uh, that means a lot. I I really appreciate you digging that one up, and um, you know it's meaningful. Thank you, thank you. I just uh, I enjoy talking about the truth. <laughs> you know. And since we don't get to come there much, uh, you know, I've got to leave something. <laughs> I, I hope you've enjoyed talking to me today. I really have enjoyed interviewing you, Duke. I have. I really have. It's been my joy, honestly. And when you're in town, uh, and that's nice to hear, that means a lot. When you're in town, it, would you mind, is there any way I can catch up with you in Honolulu, maybe grab a quick photo, possibly if you have some time, maybe record a brief thing in person? Call me at this number, uh, come to the hotel, or just before the show, or whatever. Okay. Oh, check in with you on your cell. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Hey, I appreciate it. I'm giving you a big hug. Absolutely. Man, you're the king. I'm high-fiving you, Duke. I appreciate it, dude. I really do. You've been really kind to me. I will buzz you when you're here and and uh, would love to record a brief interview with you. Picture or whatever, okay? You're a good guy, and thank you again. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Travel safe. All right. Aloha. Right. Aloha. This is Duke Fakir from The Four Tops. And you're tuned to a guy that's really worth listening to. This is my real good friend, Dave Lawrence. Aloha, this is Duke Fakir of the Four Tops. And you're tuned to the only show that matters with my good friend, Dave Lawrence.